Hi, and welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. For today's project, we're trying to program our aiming system for these Dish Tailgater RV satellite dishes. So these are supposed to be standalone little satellite dishes for Dish Network. You can bring them out tailgating, camping, RVing, whatever. They come with an all-in-one plastic dome. I've taken the top of the dome off so we can get to the guts of this thing, and I think they look a lot cooler without the top on. Now in a previous video, I found a way to interface with these using a USB A to A cable to this little console port here. That lets us connect to this using a Linux command terminal, and then we can actually send commands to the dish to get it to rotate, elevate, and report the signal strength. Now my eventual idea with this is to automate that process, get this little dish to scan azimuth and elevation, report the signal strength at each position, and give me kind of a signal strength map of the sky, or at least however much of the sky this little dish can see. Now eventually I'd like to run this on my CyberDeck, or my little PyCorder, or some kind of portable computer system to control these dishes anywhere I want to go. But for right now we're just trying to develop the Python code on our desktop computer. And it's been quite a while since I did any programming or took any kind of coding classes. I don't think I even really learned any Python back in college. We mostly learned C, C++, some JavaScript. Now I have had some help from Ivan with the YouTube channel for today's adventure, and he's got some code suggestions for this project. I'm uh, kind of following along with some of what he's done. I'm trying to develop my own code. I'm looking online to see how other people do things like nested loops and serial TTY port interfaces, all kinds of stuff that's gonna go into controlling these dishes from a script. Now I'm assuming that developing the actual Python code is going to be a long, tedious process full of lots of false starts, lots of wrong directions, lots of syntax errors. Basically it's going to be really boring, so we're not going to show all of the development process in the video. I will try to put the final code on my website, we'll link that down below. But again, I'm not much of a programmer. Despite going to college for computer science, despite going to grad school for computer science, I don't really know how to code very well, so I'm sure my code's going to be very embarrassing, very kludgy, and I'll get lots of comments saying, why didn't you do it this way? And that's fine, it's always fun to learn more skills and learn better ways to do this kind of thing. While I won't go over every stumbling block along the way, I might stop to mention a few weird errors or problems with the code. For example, when I send this to the dish, I'm only getting the first letter or first character that's trying to be sent over. So this is currently the ugly, hacky way to overcome that single character uh, write command. I just send each character on a separate write line. Now I know this is completely wrong, it looks wrong, it feels wrong, but it works at least to write commands out to the dish. We see VER was sent and the device responds with the version information. So another thing I need to remember when programming this is the designers put the coordinate system counterclockwise rather than clockwise. So if we were facing azimuth zero or south, then 90 degrees would be over here clockwise. However, if I tell this to go to as angle 90, it goes counterclockwise 90 degrees. So sometimes when I run this, I actually get the number out that I want, but then sometimes I get these extra control characters, sometimes I just get nothing. It's kind of inconsistent what it returns. Someone suggested I look at this in cool term, which displays all the raw data coming in, including non-printable characters and control characters. So here's our console on the dish tailgater. We're not just getting the raw number that I'm looking for, we're getting all these other control characters as well. All right, I think I have most of the code figured out, thanks to some help from Reddit and some friends who are better at Python than I am. Everything looks like it's functional, which probably means I'll still have some syntax errors to get through. But I think we're about ready to try running this dish, see if it'll pan back and forth, and if we'll get a signal reading. Currently I'm powering the dish off of a wall adapter at 14 volts. It wants somewhere between 13 and 18, the closest I could find was 14, and then I've just got that little 45 cent Axeman power injector. Not hooked to any output because we don't have a TV set up to this. We're just reading all the signal strength outputs through the USB connector. Now I could be reading my signal strengths through the coax cable onto an RTL SDR or something, 
but I kind of wanted to do all of it in the dish if possible, since the dish already has an RF receiver, already reports the signal strength. I really wanted to get that working. And a Reddit user named Pot of Crows was really helpful with that. I posted on the Learn Python subreddit to try to figure out how to get data out of that string that was being returned by the dish, and his suggestion was really useful. Let's try running the full code. Well, knock on wood, so far this is working. Before I actually take it outside, I do want to check if it's going to start indexing backwards once it hits 270. Again, this is 270 degrees because Dish Networks engineers wanted to be different, so it's backwards from a normal compass. But once it hits this position, it should start scanning back around clockwise. I changed my bitmap handling so it writes out a value for each pixel during each loop iteration. That way, if the thing crashes halfway through, at least I've got some data in the image. And you can actually see right here, the bitmap is updating a little bit at a time. Yes, the image is upside down right now, but I can just flip it later. All right, so here is our output, and I did end this scan a little early because it just started pointing at the ceiling. Now, this is the original 160 by 70 pixel image. That is exactly how many steps the scan does horizontally and vertically, and so that's how many pixels it outputs. One pixel for each position. So to make that a little more visible, I scaled it up. This is the raw image. It's fairly boring, although we do notice a little bit of a hot spot in that lower right. So here I've cleaned things up a little bit more. I've bumped up the contrast so we can more easily see the differences in signal strength. So again, this is a map of my office in the KU microwave band. Let's look at an actual picture of the room from the same position. And since this dish scan acts a little bit like a panorama, we'll look at a panorama of the room. I'll throw them both over the top of each other here just to show a little more detail. So that big blob on the lower right of high RF signal corresponds exactly to one of my computers. That is my video editing tower, and that actually has a big hole in the front where part of the case is missing. So you can see there's a lot of microwave energy leaking out of that case. Since that worked so well scanning inside the office, we've switched to an outdoor scan. This is what this has been intended for all along. We're running this off of my DIY cyber deck, running the Python code on there. We've got the dish set up outside the window, and we're just running all the cables through that hole in the screen that the cat's conveniently left for me. So here's what we get after running this outside, and we can see a few things really quickly here. On the left, we actually see two lumps lower down. Those are trees in the yard, and then on the bottom right, we see the rest of the tree line kind of to the south of my house. We can see the edges of my overhanging eaves up in the upper right and left corners. We'll overlay that on a view of the yard from a panoramic perspective looking from the same spot. And then we'll show what those two look uh, combined. And you can actually see the difference between the wall of the house and the eaves of the house. I ran this again at night and got nearly an identical image. So now we're looking at the signal with a better color map with some of the edges trimmed off, some of the outlying values discarded that were either due to errors or due to the way that I was indexing my array. So now we see the nice black sky, we see that blue and purple stuff, which is basically the edges of my house at the top right, top left. We see the tree line down at the bottom. We even see an electrical pole there sticking up on the right. And we see a much more defined band of signal blobs in the sky. Each one of those bright dots is the radio beacon from a TV satellite in geostationary orbit. So just what are we looking at when we see that arc of satellites in the sky? Well, a great way to visualize Stuff in Space is the website StuffIn.Space. I've got that pulled up here. I'll throw a link down in the description below. Currently, we're seeing every satellite, piece of orbital debris, booster, etc. that is known and tracked in orbit. And yeah, it's a mess. You can see this whole band here of the low Earth orbit satellites. Those are the ones you see in the night sky moving quickly across. These are things like the polar orbiting weather satellites that I've looked at in other videos, things like Starlink. And then we've got this whole ring of geostationary orbit. So these satellites orbit the Earth once per day at exactly the same rotation that the Earth itself rotates. So they're always over the same position. And you can see they're positioned in kind of a belt around the equator. This is what's known as the Clark Belt, after sci-fi author Arthur C. Clarke, who first proposed geostationary satellites. And this is where you'll find your TV satellites, your geostationary weather satellites, spy satellites, all kinds of stuff is out here. 
since we're in the northern hemisphere, we're essentially looking down at this plane of satellites that circles the equator. If we were on the equator, they'd be just a straight line in the sky, but we're looking at this band from a little bit higher. So to us here in the northern hemisphere, it appears like an arc in the southern sky. So one thing that's really interesting about this image is it shows why I have so much trouble getting certain satellites with my small dishes. In the past, I've tried to pick up Galaxy 17, and you can see how much fainter that one is compared to the commercial satellites like DirecTV, Echostar, etc. I've also tried to pick up Galaxy 13, which is at 127 West, right in between DirecTV 8 and Galaxy 12. So it's barely even visible, if at all, in this image. Now I talked to a satellite expert who said I'm probably seeing a few more in between 101 West and 61.5 West. There are a couple Canadian satellites in there with their transponder antennas aimed north of us up towards Canada. So we're getting a little bit of signal from them, but not as much. Specifically, Nimic 5 at 72 West is aimed towards Canada, and you can see how much dimmer it is than Echostar 15 that's aimed more directly at us. Now, why aren't we seeing more satellites off to the far left and far right? Well, those would be over the oceans. On the far right of this image, the satellites would be over the Pacific, and on the far left, they'd be over the Atlantic. The transponders from any TV satellites over there would probably also be aimed somewhere else, like Alaska or Hawaii, so we aren't going to be seeing the signals from them. Here's a quick graphic showing the relative density of commercial satellites in geosynchronous orbit. You can definitely see how more populated areas like North America, Europe, and Asia have far more satellites in their orbital slots than relatively empty spaces like the Pacific Ocean. So I tried to implement a method of getting a higher resolution image. My previous images, I'm incrementing the x-axis, the azimuth, on a full degree. Now, there are other methods you can increment this. You can do it by single steps, or you can nudge it. And a nudge is supposed to be 0.02 of a degree. Theoretically, that means I should be able to have five times the resolution. Unfortunately, the nudge command is not very accurate and a nudge clockwise is not necessarily the same motor travel as a nudge counterclockwise. I'm doing a little test here to see if I can image my phone in the microwave band, and unfortunately, my dish is drifting way off to the left. So those nudges in one direction are building up in more and more of a positional error. So here's what our image looks like, and you can see it's very diagonally oriented. So the x-axis has drifted off to the side during the course of the scan. So far we've done two applications with this system. We've directly imaged satellites in the sky and we've imaged microwave radiation coming from an internal source like my computer in the house. Both of those applications were directly looking at microwave sources. Now what we're trying to do is view a scene indirectly using ambient microwave radiation to illuminate it. So I'm looking north now, and essentially I'm using the satellites in the sky up behind us here to paint microwave radiation back at the house, at the yard, and we're gonna be looking at that with our dish system. I just had these milk crates piled up to provide a nice flat base for the satellite dish to sit on, and then we're running the scan using our DIY cyber deck down at the bottom there. Now remember, we're not transmitting anything from this system. We don't have Wi-Fi on it, we're not using it like a radar, we're using it more like a camera, where it's passively picking up microwave radiation, RF radio signals, and using those to create a picture. And when I talk about radiation, I'm using that as a term interchangeably with radio signals. I'm not talking about anything dangerous, I'm not talking about anything that gives you cancer. These are just radio signals that are out there floating around. In fact, the sun is one of the biggest sources of RF radiation out in the environment, including 11 gigahertz, including KU band microwave that we're looking at right now. Occasionally, the sun lines up just right in line with a TV satellite and you lose your satellite signal. If all the elements line up, your satellite dish is going to pick up the sun instead of your TV program. So our scan of the house is complete and here's what we've got. Now it may not look like much, but you can actually make out a few things. We've got our two windows here. We've got our tree behind the house. Now all this stuff up in the sky is noise or interference and that's likely from microwave links, aircraft radar, all kinds of random stuff. Now there are a couple different color maps I can use. Some of these bring out features like the windows a little more, some of them bring out features like the tree in the background. So here's our microwave view compared to the exact same view from a camera, visible light. And then here's a 50% overlay of the microwave view right on top of the house. 
Even with the random background noise in the sky, I think that's a pretty cool view of my house. Well, I've been having a ton of fun with this project. It is really cool to see how well this is working, and this is honestly working way better than my satellite project with some of these same dishes from last week where I tried to make a miniature array. This time, I'm actually getting results. I'm learning a ton more code. I'm learning a lot more about radio theory, about math, about satellite stuff. I think I learned way more programming, math, and science just screwing around with obsolete equipment than I ever did in college. So that just goes to show you don't necessarily need a fancy college degree, you don't necessarily need an expensive STEM kit or educational kit to learn some of these things. Just go out to your local surplus store, go root around in a dumpster, get something cool that you want to mess around with, get some old computers that you can break that you don't care about, or if you have a kid that's into STEM stuff, let them find something cool and pick a goal for it and then work towards that goal. Uh, even my failures here have been a learning experience. I tried doing a higher resolution version of this and I was never able to get that to work due to some motor issues, but I still used a lot more math just thinking about that particular problem than I've used in years. Now there are some other projects that do very similar things to my satellite imaging here. Thought Emporium has a video on something like this. There's a professor named James Eguar who has a project like this online. They have a lot of their documentation and information online, but a lot of their stuff uses custom hardware, custom antennas. It's less straightforward than just grabbing an old dish like this and plugging in a USB cable. So this method, if you can get your hands on the right dish, is pretty straightforward, pretty simple, and it worked really well for me. Now there are about a hundred different versions of this dish. I own four of these. None of them are quite the same, and this is the only one I have with the right USB connection. I have another one with a mini USB, but I haven't been able to get it to work. I'm not sure if it's broken or not. That is the one with some water damage. Someone apparently actually took that one fishing, like I said in last week's video. Now I could definitely do some other stuff with this, which I won't get to in this video. I could make it more portable with a built-in battery, a built-in Raspberry Pi or other mini computer, and I could have an all-in-one totable microwave surveying station. Just bring the dish in, set it in the middle of the room, set it in a field, set it in some environment, fire it up, have it scan around and produce a map of the RF signal strength in that area. That'd be kind of fun. I could try to modify it into a live satellite tracker for low Earth orbit satellites. However, I'm, I'm not quite sure if it's fast enough. You see out there, it kind of jerks around, it moves pretty slowly. The minimum time for that RF watch command is one second. So for every position it goes to, it has to sit at that position and wait for a second to get its RF reading. That might be too slow to track something like a HamSat or like a polar orbiting weather satellite. I could do some experiments with things like passive radar. That's something I might get into in the future as well. I did learn a lot of Python. Not necessarily the most optimized or efficient Python because I'm sure a lot of my code is still very kludgy. I'm sure there are better and faster ways to do some of those things. But it was fun to learn the theory behind it and learn how to actually do things like string separation, mathematical transformations, array stuff, etc. Anyway, that's enough of me babbling here. We're going to wrap up this video. Stay tuned for other satellite projects. And then, of course, all of my regular spring and summer projects are coming up. Winter is kind of the time when I work on electronics. I work on antennas because I can do a lot of that stuff inside. Once spring rolls around, I'm going to be working on trains. I'm going to be working on boats. I'm going to be working on sandland. More outside stuff. So we're going to shift from the save it for parts in outer space channel back over to some of the more traditional projects that I've done in the past. But whether you're interested in radio stuff, space stuff, or just DIY boats made out of garbage, my channel has all that. So check out my past videos to see what else we have. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.